Yes. Oh, thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. This is Senate Health and Welfare, April 17th. We continue to take testimony and learn about what's going on during the COVID emergency. One of the things our committee has taken, um, as our committee has taken testimony, we've heard from folks in the, uh, both the designated agency world and the healthcare environment that uh, internet connections, uh, access to broadband, and as well as uh, cell phone connections, those, those remote connections are extremely important in our state, both for workers at home, but more importantly for access to care and making sure that people who are isolated have um, an opportunity to reach out to their healthcare workers. So today we, uh, I thought it would be good for us to get uh, some up-to-date information first from Ledge Council and then from the Department of Public Service about uh, what we have in the state and what's going on and what the thinking is. So uh, Maria, thank you for being here. Uh, we appreciate your time. And I think this is the first time you've been, is this the first time you've been back to health and welfare in a while? I think it is. I think it's the first time I've testified before Senate Health and Welfare in about, I don't know, nine, nine years. <laughs> so well, it's about time. I'm happy to be back. I wish it were actually in the committee room. I, really I know, well. Enjoy that room, so maybe one day. We'll make, we'll make that happen. Okay, that would be great. Okay. I, I, I wish you could make our committee room a bigger room. <laughs> it's so small. <laughs> Well, no, it's because we have a lot of work to do, Senator. We, we're overwhelmed. Um, so, Maria, why don't you um, give us some uh, testimony? And we had that conversation. I'm going to leave it open to you uh, how to proceed with uh, your testimony. And we do have um, something happened. You. Uh, so I think that I. Oh, that's you. That oh, yeah, but she's sharing the screen. <laughs> so I hope that's okay. That I hope I didn't jump the gun there, but I was also. Nope, this is great. Go right ahead. Making sure that it that it works. Um, so, uh, for the record, Maria Royal with Legislative Council, um, and I think the chair just actually did a very good overview of what um, I'm going to be covering today, which is. You know, connectivity in general, what's the status of broadband in Vermont in general, um, particularly as it relates to some of the needs that have arisen with respect to COVID-19. And then also focusing on- Sorry, some of the Senator, yeah. um, Senator McCormick? Yes. And then focusing on some of the telehealth uh, initiatives that are in the CARES Act. So it's a there's a lot to cover, um, and I think there's probably more in here and a lot of detail that maybe you're not so much interested at this point in getting uh, into the weeds, but it may be helpful in terms of just providing a broad context for some of the you know the broadband issues and challenges um, that the state is dealing with. Um, Excuse me, I apologize for interrupting. I had heard um, the chair call my name. Um, I'm wondering what's, what's up. Uh, Senator Lyons, I think you're muted. Yeah, Senator Lyons, you're muted. She wanted you to mute um, Senator McCormick. Uh, you're, I thought I was. The you sound. When, it's, when it's red and has a line going through it on the mic, it means you're muted, right? Yes. Yeah, but we heard you speaking to someone in your in your home. Huh. Okay, thanks. Try, just try it again. It's not a big deal. I'm going to okay. mute myself now. All right, I'm, I'm going to test it. Okay. Okay, but it was red with a line going through it. Let me just, just see. You're all good. All right, Maria, sorry for the interruption. Not a problem at all. So with that being said, um, this is just an overview of what's going to be in the presentation. Um, again, making the connection between the delivery of telehealth services and the need for the underlying technology, the broadband infrastructure to support the delivery of those services. 
I'm going to talk very broadly about what Congress has done to date in response to COVID-19 as it relates to uh, both telehealth specifically and broadband deployment generally. Um, I'll also review some regulatory actions taken by the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, as well as some uh, regulatory action taken uh, in the state of Vermont uh, that pertain to communications in, in light of the pandemic. And then the, the next section has to do with the programs and initiatives that exist currently in Vermont. These are pre-COVID-19 programs that are all related to broadband build out or the facilitation of broadband deployment. And again, I think that's, that's really broad. Um, I don't expect you're, wanting, you're gonna wanna get into the details of all of those programs, but they are here as you think about, you know, going forward, uh, what areas you're most interested in and how you can get funds out to support services like telehealth. Um, and then I just conclude with some data uh, that's relevant to the status of broadband deployment currently in Vermont. And then I know the department is gonna follow up and really look at the, the mapping and the availability of you know, where there's service and where there isn't um, generally and also at a granular level. So that's, there's a lot of information there. Please stop me at any time if you have questions um, and we'll just start going through. So I did include some definitions on this slide and the following slide. Um, I'm not going to read through them word for word, uh, but you know the sometimes the terms uh, I've noticed telehealth and telemedicine, for example, are used interchangeably. Um, but really, telehealth in Vermont, at least as defined by the Department of Health Access, um, is kind of the broader category of. Uh, services related to healthcare, uh, including information storage, healthcare education, health administration, as well as telemedicine, which is the next definition. And I just realized that I, I've cited Title 18, but that should actually be Title 8. This is the definition um, in Title 8 currently for telemedicine. It relates to coverage, health insurance coverage for telemedicine. And so telemedicine in Vermont is you know, patient-centered, looking at the delivery of healthcare services to patients, and that could be diagnosis, consultation, treatment. And I just wanted to compare that to, because I'm gonna be talking a, a lot about some FCC telehealth programs. Um, there's some consistency and, and some differences in the terminology. Telehealth pretty much used the same way uh, by the FCC as it is in Vermont. I would say one difference, you know, instead of referring to telemedicine, um, I think the equivalent term at, at the FCC would be connected care services. But again, patient oriented, the delivery of that care um, to the patient remotely, whether it's at a mobile location or at a residence. So that's just um, to be clear kind of about some, some of the terminology. Underlying all of this, telehealth in general, is uh, the assumption that you have the infrastructure, the broadband network to deliver the services. Um, again, which is why I think you're looking at broadband and the status of deployment in Vermont generally. So what's not covered here um, are you know, the telehealth issues that are related to things like privacy, insurance, licensing, all the things that you would normally go to Jen Carvey for, um, who can give you, um, you know, much much more information on that. But this is really just looking at some of the newer programs and kind of focusing on the infrastructure as well. Um, also, I didn't look at there are a number of federal telehealth programs that are not part of the CARES Act that predated the CARES Act. I didn't mention them here. I'm not sure that I'm aware of all of them, but just to let you know, there are numerous federal programs out there offered by different agencies. So I'm just gonna focus on the ones uh, that were funded or created under the CARES Act or in response to the recent pandemic. 
So in terms of congressional action, broad review, you know that Congress has been rolling out uh, legislation in response to the pandem pandemic in phases. There have been three phases um, of legislation. You'll see the last one adopted or enacted and signed on March 27th. That's the CARES Act. So that's the $2.2 trillion economic stimulus package related to social distancing measures. And uh, in terms of the connectivity issues in the CARES Act, again, these are uh, issues that have been brought to the forefront because of the pandemic and because of the, the social distancing, the need for remote telehealth access, distance learning, telecommuting, digital inclusion, meaning not only do people have access, but is it affordable? Can they access it? Um, do they have the literacy skills? All of these issues now have become extremely important uh, to the extent we are all uh, in our homes trying to go about our daily activities and having our needs met. So I'm gonna focus on telehealth, as I've mentioned before. And just to give you some idea, um, in the CARES Act, there are some emergency appropriations um, that are specific to uh, federal agencies, some existing programs, and some are expansions to programs. For example, 180, that should be million, um, to the Health Resources and Services Administration within the Department of Health and Human Services. This is to expand services and capacity for rural hospitals, including telehealth services. There's approximately $2 billion to the Department of Veterans Affairs to support IT for telework and telehealth, including broadband for veterans for telemental healthcare services. M Maria? Yep, sure. Uh, um, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try not to interrupt you no as problem. you're going along. Uh, one of the questions that I think we have around the $180 million for going for tele, uh, rural hospitals does that include, uh, do you know, I mean, it's probably down in the weeds somewhere, um, whether or not the hospital can provide um, technology to someone living a distance from the clinic or the hospital? I mean, can, is it, does it allow for patient access to um, telehealth away from the hospital? Right, so are you talking about like connected devices, like actually having a, maybe a tablet or this, or yes. maybe a subsidy yeah. for the service? Yes. You know, I'm, I'm not certain. Uh, okay. I would want to, I can absolutely find that out for you. Um, I just can't recall off the top of my head. Yeah. Okay, so and, and maybe um, Commissioner Tierney might have investigated okay. that, I don't know. Okay. And maybe when uh, the department is testifying, it might give me a chance to go, <laughs> to go look and see if I can answer that for you today. All right. Um, I know, for example, the, the money that goes to the Veterans Affairs, there is a subsidy uh, for broadband access for, for veterans for, in their home so that they have their own subscription um, and they can, call, they can get money for some of the costs of that service. Um, and then uh, there is another, an existing program that's offered by the Rural Utility Service, which is in the US Department of Agriculture. Um, this is a program, so they got $25 million under the CARES Act. And this is a program that provides grants to support rural communities and their access to telecommunications enabled information, audio, video equipment, as well as related advanced technologies um, not just for medical professionals, but also for students and teachers. The one, so there are two um, fairly uh, substantial programs, new pro, well, one of them is a new program. Um, the other one, and then there's some appropriations to some existing programs, but in terms of what's in the CARES Act, there was appropriated $200 million to the FCC for a new program called the COVID-19 Telehealth Program. The program's already been adopted. It was adopted on April 2nd. And 
these funds can be used to support the provision of telehealth services and can be used to reimburse healthcare services and broadband connections at the from the from where the provide, provider is located and also for where the patient is located so the money can be used to reimburse patients uh, broad broadband access the funding window opened on april 13th and i just actually um, read today that grants have already started to go out um, I think about $3 million of the $200 million has already been appropriated, and the range in grants has been between $200,000 to a $1 million. A $1 million is about, is about the cap that they're estimating to give out. So I do mention that because it is, um, so obviously the money's going out on a rolling basis, and it's only going to be available for as long as uh, there is funding in the program. So once that 200 million is expended, uh, the, the program will end or if the pandemic um, ends. But so this is directly related to costs that are being incurred to either provide uh, COVID-19 health services to patients in their homes or to provide other healthcare services uh, to keep people from having to come to the hospitals and healthcare facilities where they might be more likely um, uh, to be exposed to the virus. So this is an immediate program that's available now. Um, you can see, uh, I won't go through all of them, uh, you know, but this is just sort of for, you know, kind of public awareness of who eligible healthcare providers are, nonprofit and, and, and public entities. Um, there's a list of the types of services that are covered under this particular grant program, telecommunication services and broadband connectivity services, um, the patient monitoring platforms, as well as the devices and equipment uh, that patients can use in their home. The other program that I wanted to mention, so. I'm now moving into uh, what the FCC has done under its existing regulatory authority. So this was not part of the CARES Act, but there have been um, actions taken related to what you're interested in. And in particular is the Connected Care Pilot Program. So the telehealth, uh, the COVID-19 telehealth program, that's an immediate program to deal with the pandemic right now. But the FCC is also looking at um, more long-term ways that uh, telehealth can be used to improve health outcomes, reduce healthcare costs, um, et cetera. And you know, whether or not going forward, universal service funds um, should be used to, uh, on an ongoing basis to support telehealth services. So this is, a, again, it's a pilot program. Um, it's not clear yet how many projects will be funded, but they will be funded for a period of three years. Um, there's gonna be a particular focus on providing healthcare to low-income persons and veterans. Um, but again, this is, you know, a program really designed to help the FCC better understand uh, what it can do in terms of bringing broadband uh, to populations that uh, might most benefit. So is there a, uh, do you know what the eligibility level is when they talk about uh, low income? Or is that, that's probably back there in the weeds as well. But. I, you know what? I don't know if it is defined. Um, okay. Would it be then maybe uh, left to the state to make a determination of that? Or we don't know. It's okay. Don't, don't look it up now. Don't worry about it. But I think it's, it'll be a question that we might no, have. No, no. I think it's a, it's a great question. I don't remember seeing any kind of income threshold in the report and order. I do know that uh, the Wireline Service Bureau you know, has issued a guidance on the COVID-19 telehealth program. 
And I'm not sure if there's been a guidance issued related to this okay. uh, pilot program, but that might be where that information is. So I can look Thank you. for that okay. as well. Yeah. And so then uh, I just wanted to also touch upon, you know, this is just so that you're aware generally of some of the other FCC programs uh, that are pre-existing programs, but uh, have been fully funded in at least for a period of time related to the pandemic. There's the rural healthcare program, which has two components, a telecom program and a healthcare connect fund program. And these uh, basically provide discounts to healthcare facilities for broadband, um, as well as uh, well, actually, I don't know that the Healthcare Connect program um, funds a discount to patients. I think it's primarily to the providers. So then there is also under their E-rate program, which applies not just to rural healthcare clinics, but to schools and libraries. Um, you might have heard about um, uh, provide telecom providers um, opening up or providing new and expanded Wi-Fi hotspots access to Wi-Fi um, at schools and at libraries, um, even at healthcare facilities. Uh, but there are some federal rules uh, that normally prohibit tele uh, communications providers from providing discounted or free service. Uh, has to do with competitive uh, bidding procedures, but those rules have been waived, uh, which is why you are seeing kind of the proliferation of, of free hotspots for at least the duration of the pandemic. Um, there have been some tweaks to the Lifeline program. Uh, you're probably familiar with that program. This is a subsidy program um, for voice, telephone, and broadband access for low-income individuals. And the, the FCC regulations that have been um, taken uh, in response to COVID-19 have to basically keep, do with keeping current subscribers enrolled in the program and not being kicked off because they failed to recertify or re-verify. Um, and then finally, I'm just going to touch upon, you know, one of the other things that the FCC has done is allowed for greater use of spectrum. Um, so the availability of spectrum is usually, uh, you know, to licensed entities, uh, the FCC has granted wireless providers greater access to um, deal with the increase in broadband usage. So there are um, a lot of things that have happened at the regulatory level um, under the FCC's existing authority. And then that brings us to some of the initiatives that the FCC is encouraging. As you know, um, with some of the changes that have happened at the federal level in terms of how broadband is classified, um, the ability of the FCC and the states to regulate broadband has been curtailed However, the FCC has been uh, encouraging providers to take actions um, that uh, will help to mitigate some of the um, potential disconnections and lack of service that might be caused by the pandemic. For example, you may have heard of the Keep Americans Connected initiative. Uh, this is basically where companies pledge for 60 days not to terminate service because a customer can't pay as a result of the pandemic. Uh, the company uh, pledges not to waive any late fees uh, related to the pandemic and then to open up their Wi-Fi hotspots uh, based to the general public. So to date, over 700 companies have um, taken this pledge and uh, you will see, you'll hear from the department, uh, they're actually keeping track of uh, what programs and services the Vermont companies are offering um, during the pandemic. Also, uh, the FCC has been encouraging um, providers to either establish or to expand and improve their low-income 
broadband programs. Um, these are discounted services that some providers already offer and some providers have uh, just established. And again, uh, Vermont companies are participating in this and the department is keeping track of that um, on their website. And then finally, uh, this pertains primarily to wireless companies. Um, the FCC has asked that they relax their data usage limits. So with the increased usage of um, broadband, uh, people don't exceed and then have to incur the costs of uh, going over their, their usage limits. So this just gives you a kind of a general sense of what's happening at the federal level through Congress, uh, through the FCC's regulatory authority, and then the FCC uh, encouraging uh, certain actions. So bringing it a little bit more local in Vermont, um, with respect to telecommunications, as well as other services, natural gas and electric, the Public Utility Commission has issued a moratorium uh, that basically prohibits involuntary service disconnections um, until, and I believe that's in effect till April 30th at, at this point. Um, so your service is not gonna be disconnected um, in Vermont, uh, at least for the period of this uh, moratorium. And then again, in terms of what DPS has been doing, I mentioned already, I'm not sure if I mentioned the first one, actually, the, they're mapping those, those Wi-Fi hotspots that are available um, statewide. They provided a map so that the public knows where they can go to access broadband if they don't have it at home. Um, and then what I did mention earlier is what Vermont companies are doing, what kinds of programs they're offering at this time. So now we're going to get into, I don't think I'm going to go into this in detail um, unless you would like me to, but this is going to just touch upon some pretty significant federal programs that are related more generally to broadband build out in unserved and underserved areas. Um, there's a reconnect program that's offered through the rural utility service. And there's the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, which is offered through the FCC. Um, and again, this is just addressing, you know, providing grants, subsidies uh, to providers, to internet service providers, to build out broadband in areas that don't have access and the speeds that they would need to uh, Insurers available has to be at least 25.3. Those are the download and upload speeds that relate to uh, broadband access. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I'm just going to touch on is, you know, wireless connectivity is an issue that's getting a lot of attention by the FCC. Um, there's been a lot of investment. There are new funds that have been created. There are regulatory actions that have been taken to basically um, support and expand wireless connectivity, whether it's through 5G service or um, increased use, unlicensed use of the radio spectrum and potentially service that would be offered by low earth orbit satellites. I know, I don't think you wanna get into all of the details, um, but this is just kind of more of your general awareness of all these activities that are taking place now that will have an impact on the types of service that are available to Vermonters, potentially in the very hard to reach high cost areas. Um, I'm not a network engineer, so I can't talk specifically about, you know, particularly for the newer, more advanced technologies, when those services will be available in Vermont and at what speeds and et cetera. But this is kind of broad, you know, context for you to keep in mind. And then again, if just, you know, to, to kind of be aware of some of this will just be a reminder, um, but what Vermont is doing related to broadband deployment um, generally. 
Uh, there have been a number of uh, grant and subsidy programs created, which I'll talk about on this page here. These are just the broad categories. Um, you have taken a number of steps to facilitate broadband deployment. We'll go, we'll go over these, probably not in detail, but you know, you can consult this as you, as you figure out how you want to move forward and the things that most interest you um, related to healthcare or public health and public safety issues. Areas around digital inclusion, public health and safety, data collection and planning, and then some consumer protection. So just generally, this is a list of some of the investments, investment programs, the grant programs that are that currently exist in Vermont. There's what's known as the Connectivity Initiative. Uh, this awards grants to internet service providers to build out in unserved and underserved areas of the state, service that is at least 25-3. Um, there's a high cost program uh, that also provides money for the build out in high cost areas. This goes particularly to the incumbent local exchange carriers. These are the uh, basically the traditional phone companies um, here in Vermont. And then there's a, what's called the Broadband Innovation Grant Program. Uh, the department is offering grants up to 60,000 uh, for any entity really uh, that wants to do a feasibility study related to broadband deployment. So uh, this could be a communications union district. Uh, it could also be an electric distribution utility uh, in fact, and up to two electric distribution utilities are eligible to receive this grant. And I believe it was just the last week the department announced that Washington Electric Co-op and uh, Vermont Electric Co-op have both applied for and received grants to do these feasibility studies. So these are electric companies um, that are considering offering um, themselves or partnering with an internet service provider to provide broadband in their service territories. So that's something that's happening in the state um, right now at a kind of a, a study, a study level. Um, and then in terms of broadband, you know, other attempts to facilitate deployment, there is a loan program through VITA, which uh, helps uh, for the startup and build out of broadband initiatives loans can be up to $4 million. Um, there's also authorizing legislation for, you're probably familiar with communications union districts. Uh, the largest CUD in Vermont currently is EC Fiber. There have been a number of other uh, areas of the state that have uh, formed CUDs, um, some of them just recently uh, this spring, others uh, last year, but they're kind of in the earlier stages of development, but those are um, in the works now. Uh, there are opportunities for uh, municipalities to work together through formation of rural economic development infrastructure district ready districts, not specific to telecom, but can be used to facilitate uh, telecommunications uh, build out in rural areas. Also, also last year, you authorized municipalities to um, engage in public-private partnerships with ISPs if they uh, would like to pursue that as an option for bringing broadband to their um, residents. And then you have other measures I'm just mentioning, this is all related um, with respect to siting of, of telecom facilities. You're familiar with the 2488 siting of cell phone towers on a statewide basis as opposed to through Act 250. And you have rules related to um, making it easier for broadband uh, entities that want to attach their facilities to poles like antennas. Um, there are rules in place that will facilitate that process. So, then in terms of digital inclusion, I mentioned that has a lot to do um, with affordability. So people who might have access to a broadband connection but can't afford um, to pay the, the monthly fees 
As I mentioned earlier, there is a federal lifeline program. Vermont also has uh, a supplement to that program. It's specific to voice services. Vermont also has a telecom relay service, which provides funding um, for the hearing impaired so that they have equipment that they can use to enable telecommunications. Vermont uh, does a telecom plan, um, which looks out 10 years to see what the needs of the state are with respect to broadband uh, and uh, offers recommendations for how the state can proceed and target resources and also does mapping of broadband services. And you're gonna hear from the department uh, you know, about what the current state of broadband is more specifically. And then I just included in here, um, just trying to be comprehensive there, in terms of consumer protection issues that have gone on, you know, this is related to net neutrality. So as you know, the federal net neutrality rules have been repealed. Um, there's an issue around preemption, whether states can have their own net neutrality rules. Vermont took uh, the step of requiring that internet service providers comply with net neutrality if they want a government contract for internet service. Uh, that law has been stayed uh, pending the litigation that's going on related to uh, the FCC repeal of the net neutrality rules. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, and also the Attorney General's office monitors ISP compliance with net neutrality, not because they're required to, uh, but just to help Vermonters understand which providers uh, do comply with net neutrality rules um, to the extent they want to, uh, Vermonters want to uh, access that information. So then a uh, couple of uh, programs here related to public health and safety. Um, E911, uh, there are concerns or have been concerns related to outages and the ability of Vermonters to make, uh, to access the 911 system. So a couple of things that are going on right now, the 911 board is actually working on a rule that you uh, authorized last year related to reporting of outages by uh, communications providers. Uh, in particular, the reporting already, already applies to the landline phone companies. So this is to expand it to the wireless carriers, the cellular car carriers, uh, as well as the VoIP providers. So if you get your voice service over a broadband network, um, you, uh, those providers would also have to report to 911 if there are any system outages. There are also issues related to backup power obligations, you know, ensuring that uh, particularly for those VoIP providers that are not line powered, um, that people are aware of, you know, that you can, if, if there's a power outage, you might want to have backup battery to ensure that you're able to continue to call. Uh, and some of this is just consumer awareness so that they understand this isn't the traditional copper phone line that you uh, would still be able to use even if your power goes out. That's not the case for these um, internet enabled voice services. So this is, um, you know, these are kind of things that are being looked at uh, to keep, uh, make sure that consumers understand uh, what their access is. And then I think you're familiar with the CARE program, uh, the Citizens Assistance Registry for Emergencies program. And this is basically a registry where people who might have special needs um, at the in, in the time of a, a, either a power outage or a disaster and evacuation, this, these could be uh, elderly individuals, people with limited mobility or have specialized medical equipment. Basically, it's a, it's a notice um, to first responders uh, so that they understand in the event of a, some kind of a, um, in, uh, a situation in a particular area that there may be particular uh, Vermonters that will need some assistance. Um, so that's a relatively new program. 
And then uh, the chair also asked that I give kind of an update on FirstNet. Um, just as a kind of a brief reminder, uh, if you haven't thought about FirstNet in a while. So FirstNet, First Responder Network Authority is actually, it's an agency uh, within the US Department of Commerce. And they were charged with building out a nationwide broadband network that's dedicated to public safety. Um, they awarded a contract to AT&T to build that network. And then each of the states were given the opportunity to decide whether they wanted to um, kind of opt in to the AT&T solution, FirstNet solution for their state or to potentially contract with another provider. Um, Vermont ultimately decided to uh, go with the AT&T FirstNet solution. So AT&T right now uh, is in the process of building what's called a radio access network for Vermont, the wireless communication services that will give first responders prioritized and preemptive coverage. Um, they are, AT&T is a, permitted under the program to use any excess wireless capacity uh, commercially. So in terms of how that, and they have five years to basically uh, build to the, build out what they've committed to doing, which is 36 new sites in Vermont. Uh, and I believe as of now, one new cell tower became operational in 2019, and there are forecasted to be an additional 16 sites, which could be either a tower or an antenna co-located on an existing tower or building. Um, those are, are forecasted to be uh, deployed and operational this year. So that is a lot of information um, uh, about all of the programs and initiatives related to broadband going on now. Um, then the last thing that I'm going to leave you with is just to give you an idea of some connectivity uh, data points that might be of interest to you. So Vermont has a population of about 620,000 people. In terms of how we measure uh, broadband deployment, we look at, the state looks at 911 addresses. These are residential and business addresses of where you would bring internet connections. So that's, that's the measure of, of how many addresses uh, require broadband or require some kind of internet connectivity. And right now, the FCC defines broadband as 25.3. So that's what the FCC has determined is kind of the minimum speeds that you need uh, to make use of all of the um, uh, all of the, the uses that in the internet uh, is commonly used for, whether it's telehealth or whether it's um, remote working or remote learning. These are kind of, this is kind of the minimum speed that the FCC recommends um, that people have to participate fully using their, um, their broadband connections. So as of now, and this information is based on, um, some of it's based on a report that uh, the department along with the firm conducted uh, in last year, just in December, and some of it's uh, based on their information that they have on their broadband availability maps. But just in general, again, this is just to give you a sense of where Vermont is now. About 23% of Vermont addresses lack internet service at 25.3. So what the FCC uh, defines as the minimum broadband. And in that the report that I just mentioned earlier, the cost, this is just an average, and uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of potential variability here, but the cost to provide broadband, particularly fiber actually, uh, to an individual premise is about $5,000 on average. 
So if you were to build out a, a fiber connection to those 23% of Vermont addresses, it might cost you roughly $350 million. Vermont's connectivity goal, uh, what the state hopes to achieve in terms of connectivity is 100-100 symmetrical. Those are your uh, download and upload speeds. Right now, fiber is the only service that's capable of delivering that 100 symmetrical speeds. So 82% of Vermont addresses do not have access currently uh, to those speeds. And using the figures that I referenced earlier, if you were to build out to those um, addresses, it would cost you roughly in the neighborhood of $1 billion. So this is just to give you a really big picture of uh, kind of the numbers and what you're looking at, uh, you know, in terms of who has access to broadband and how achieving statewide universal access um, might be achieved. And so uh, that was a lot of information. Uh, and uh, <laughs> you let me know if there's anything I can go back and uh, answer questions or if there are things that you would like me to look into further going forward or however I can be helpful. Maria, you've done an amazing amount of work to bring this to us. Um, really appreciate the time that you've taken both to prepare this and then to present it. Uh, and it, it sounds like you've, you're, you've had some connectivity yourself between the federal government and the department and current statute. So, yeah, uh, you know what, uh, do you mind taking your presentation down and then I'll be able to see the entire committee so we can ask questions. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so uh, I, I think there probably are a lot of questions, particularly with regard to what might be coming to us from um, uh, the Federal CARES Act and other things. So what I'm going to suggest, committee, unless there's a burning question of understanding that we move on to our next witnesses, uh, because they're also going to provide us some some information that we're not or ordinarily uh, receiving in our committee. Does anybody have a burning, burning, burning question? Okay, this is good. And I would like to note for note that no one has yet brought up the conversion to fiber from something else. So we'll leave that one alone. Um, that was probably an inside joke. Um, Commissioner Tierney, thank you for being here. I know you have Clay Purvis along and I'll, I'll leave it up to you how you want to proceed with your testimony. We do have, uh, I think, three documents from you folks on our webpage. So welcome. I think this might be a first. Have you been in our committee before? Uh, officially, I think that's correct. I've not been before your committee before. I think I have uh, prior acquaintance with just about everybody on the committee. But um, it's a pleasure to be here in a formal capacity. Um, so go, way, right, go right ahead, introduce you. yourself and your topic, and we'll, we'll mute ourselves and listen. Thank you. All right, very good. Uh, the way uh, we will proceed this morning is to develop some of the details that uh, Maria presented. Uh, I agree, it was a wonderful presentation. Maria, I've seen it several times now, and it gets better every time. But uh, that's hard to do, considering that it was so good to begin with. Uh, Clay will be providing that detail. Uh, he is our expert on the substantive ins and outs of both uh, the programs and the infrastructure. To the extent that you have any more detailed questions about the infrastructure that Clay may not be able to answer off the top of his head this morning, we also have uh, a staff at the department that has some uh, pretty deep knowledge about telecommunications infrastructure and could come in and give testimony. But judging from the overview that Maria gave, I don't think this committee is gonna to need to get into that. Um, I, I will start out by giving uh, the following broad assurances. Uh, the department and Governor Scott are well aware of the importance of telemedicine and telehealth uh, in the state. Um, 
it's uh, not lost on me that um, in recent years, Medicare budgets have been cut to the point where rural hospitals have been struggling. And uh, this pandemic is really exposing what the deeper implications have been of those funding cuts, because I think on a latent level, uh, we've assumed that, oh yeah, telecommunications would be there and uh, services and, and the like at hospitals could be filled with te telemedicine and telehealth. And then something like this hits and you find that uh, that may be true for some people, but not all people. And regrettably for a lot of those people who don't have good connectivity, there's also a significant overlap with the need for telehealth and telemedicine. That said, I would wanna assure the committee that um, in terms of the adequacy of available bandwidth, that was a topic that became a hot button early on in the pandemic. Uh, the department um, is able to assure you that there is adequate bandwidth. Uh, the, the pandemic and the associated increased use of the internet is not threatening to break the internet per se. What is happening is folks are learning uh, in real time uh, some of the limitations of their data plans and the like that they've been living with um, without having to really learn the finer ins and outs because they weren't using their access the way or to the degree that they are now. However, um, many companies through the, uh, the uh, call to action from the FCC um, have lifted those data caps or put a temporary uh, halt on, on things like that. So that seems to have eased uh, whatever concerns there might have been in terms of whether people have um, the adequate ability to use their service if they have it at home. Um, but it still leaves the question of what to do for the folks who don't have uh, any access right now. Um, what the department is doing on that front is um, two things. Frankly, um, I, I took matters into my own hands last uh, Friday and issued a call to action to the uh, utilities in the state and challenged our electric utilities and our gas utility to see what they could do uh, in order to step up and perhaps help deploy um, temporary connectivity solutions, if nothing else. And um, I, we, we did that in conjunction with looking to also uh, gather data from Vermonters directly as to who it is who's at home, who has a student who can't access uh, remote learning because they don't have broadband or who can't access telehealth or people at home who can't access telehealth or telemedicine for want of broadband. I, I, would, uh, I, I, I and I, I, would, I don't mean to interrupt, but you know. Know, as you keep mentioning telehealth and telemed, there are a number of folks who need access to, um, and I think you're probably including this in your thinking, but uh, substance use disorder uh, workshops and uh, access to some of the remote needs that are out there for our workers as well, our, our counselors and so on, so. In, indeed, um, yeah. I appreciate that clarification, Senator Lyons, because Senator Cummings has been engaged on this issue as well at Senate Finance. And you're quite right. I was um, improperly lumping that in, if you will. I, I find in you're, communicating... you're, not imp you're not improperly lumping at all. But it's kind of the way we might lump it too. But I just wanted to clarify for yeah. anyone who's out there uh, looking in that there, it's it, we're trying to be as inclusive as we can yes. when we're talking about these access issues. So, in, in, thank indeed, you. Uh, yeah. no, absolutely, and, and I find. Uh, it, Having worked in this area of regulation for, for as long as I have, uh, I'm forever um, challenged by the, the granularity with which things are described and how easily you can miscommunicate and misdescribe what you're talking about. But you're getting at a different point, which is uh, the need to be inclusive in our thinking, especially when it comes to helping people. And you're quite right. Um, Later, just moments ago, the department sent out a press release uh, that describes the second half of what we're doing to try to close this um, access gap. And you'll see in that that um, the point I'm, I'm trying to get at is that uh, folks' uh, daily connection to daily essential needs and services has been uh, torn away, if you will, by the, the need to stay home. And so when I think of those essential services, uh, one of the things foremost in my mind is the access to mental health support, for instance, that you're talking about, Senator Lyons. But I will do better. That's all you can ever say. <laughs> and you were not criticizing, I know. No, no, um, you're doing you're doing great. Um, that wasn't a criticism of you. That was a communication to 
folks out there. We get it. Absolutely. Thank you. you. You got it. So what the department is trying to do on the other side, in addition to challenging the utilities to step up, is uh, we've made a direct appeal to the public to, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to identify yourselves to the department if you have a student at home who needs to be engaged in um, remote learning but can't because they don't have access to broadband, if you are somebody who is in need of telehealth, telemedicine, and as you say, um, other services of a support nature, um, if we can if we can identify clusters of individuals that puts us in a position to go back to the utilities and to say, hey, there's a group of 20 people here who all need something and don't have broadband. Can somebody put a line out there? Can somebody get a radio signal out there? Can we do something at least on a stopgap basis um, to help these people during this pandemic? Um, this um, call to action is uh, frankly an extension of an experience that I had during Tropical Storm Irene where my own home was uh, destroyed. And um, in my capacity at the time as general counsel of the Public Service Board, I saw in real time how many communities in Vermont were affected by um, the sudden absence of bridges and roads and the like. And to my mind, it's not a stretch at all to recognize that what has happened here is through the stay home, stay safe order, folks have properly confined themselves to their homes. And with that, they have had torn away this essential infrastructure, meaning their ability to make their daily um, courses or, or, or uh, contact with um, community resources, government resources, their jobs, their schools and so forth. The internet's effectively a highway. It's a, it's a road system and it's a system by which uh, information travels and uh, goods and services are, are exchanged. And if you don't have it, you're not in the loop. If you're not in the loop, you effectively are cut off much as a, a bridge or a road cuts you off if it's wiped out in a storm. So the department is hopeful that um, Vermonters will respond. Um, Senator Cummings gave us a very uh, helpful um, insight that it, it, it shouldn't need to be said, but um, modern life moves so quickly that one is apt at times to forget. Uh, if you can't get on the internet, you can't see the resources available. People need to have another ability to contact us besides just the internet. There's also the good old hotline phones. And so part of our appeal that we've launched this morning is uh, to encourage people to call the Consumer Affairs Public in, uh, Information Division of the department to let us know who you are and what your needs are. Um, we had to take a little time to roll this out because uh, we were watching what's happening at our sister agency, the Department of Labor, and we wanted to make sure that we were ready should the deluge of contacts come and uh, that we're able to, to handle them. I, I have a little staff in the uh, Consumer Affairs Public Information Division, but they pack well above their weight class. If, um, if they have enough notice. And I think at this point, we're well prepared for that. Um, I have gone on at great length and I think I have covered uh, most of what I wanted to do at the 10,000 foot level. I, I just wanted to, to let the committee know something that has evolved in, in my thinking as I deal with these um, connectivity issues. I'm increasingly aware that there are three um, intersection, there's an intersection of three points that you have to keep in mind. Sometimes we're talking about um, the affordability of connectivity. Sometimes we're talking about whether folks have the requisite gear to be able to be connected. Do they have a cell phone? Do they have a, a computer? Um, are they a low income household that is paying for a landline and also a cell phone, but they can't use their cell phone at home because they don't have connectivity. And so they're incurring an untenable double burden in trying to have both phone service and cell service in the, in the world at large. And then there's a third point, infrastructure. And uh, infrastructure, I think, is where we hurt the most. Uh, this is not a new issue, as, as so many of you on the committee know, but the pandemic has certainly made real to us that the way we've been getting by with infrastructure is, um, it's not that we haven't known it was untenable, it's that we're now really feeling in real time how untenable it is. And I am hopeful that um, we can make this clear to the federal government. That is where the department has been focusing its attention. I've been uh, both meeting with the uh, FCC commissioners personally 
I have a meeting with Chair Pai on Monday to talk with him personally about what is happening to Vermont. And we have also been engaged in litigation in trying to, um, to persuade the FCC that it needs to rethink how it disperses uh, federal dollars in the broadband front, that it's, it's not enough to just rely on a symbiotic relationship between the FCC and the industry by auctioning off monies as they do to get the market to do the right thing. I, I don't mean to use that phrase, the right thing, because it implies that one is, all, is, is perhaps not doing the right thing, but the wrong thing. It's, it's better, I think, to think of this in terms of when we first uh, embarked on breaking up the monopoly of Ma Bell, uh, which you know definitively happened in 1984, we were addressing a different set of problems. We were addressing um, the, the ills that had accrued from a monopoly that was completely unchecked, that was largely in the private sector. And uh, the, the, probably the, the signature ill at the time was that you had all this great technology and yet long distance calls were so incredibly expensive. Why? Because there was no competition for um, that expense to come down. So the good news is that um, the vision of, of technology being unleashed and uh, economic forces being unleashed to bring down prices and increase consumer options happened. Telemedicine, telehealth, for example, are a direct outgrowth of that. Um, that's, that's all good. But what we're seeing now, uh, close to, let me see if I do the math right, it's close to 40 years later. Um, I think that's right, or 45 years later. What we're, we're seeing is, um, I mean to say the time from 1984 to now, whatever that is. Um, what we're now seeing are the ill effects, if you will, of having turned uh, almost entirely to the private sector and not just having relied on, on the private sector market forces to modernize our telecommunications, but also to have restrained the states the way uh, Congress saw fit at the time to do, such that the states didn't have jurisdiction over broadband and cell service. Um, the theory was that the market would be a more efficient way to encourage the deployment and modernization. We're now seeing it's left terrible gaps that market forces simply don't uh, motivate companies to, uh, to address. And that's bad enough, but worse still is that the state governments are so hampered in their ability to do something about it. One of the things that really hampers the states is that um, even if they come up with programs like Vermont has with a connectivity fund and put some dollars in it or the Vermont Universal Service Fund and we put some dollars in it, these federal programs tend to be designed, particularly the ones at the FCC, in a manner that in the end um, penalizes the state or risks penalizing the state for putting those dollars uh, into state programs. The idea is, well, if the states put a dollar into something, we don't need to put a federal dollar into it. We don't want to overlap those dollars. There are also some other quirks, as I'm sure some committee mem members are aware, uh, such as uh, when some carriers get funding to do something in Vermont, and they do something in Vermont, and they do it well, but they don't do it perhaps the way we need it to be done. And as a result, under federal rules, uh, other carriers are foreclosed from stepping in to the gaps left by any one carrier to fix that. The, again, the, the idea being that if the federal government has lent or borrowed, uh, lent or, or granted money to a carrier to do a project, they reserve a period of time for repayment of that loan for that carrier. And the federal government doesn't want to undermine that carrier's ability to repay the loan by uh, allowing other competitors into the area. Uh, it's all very good on a drawing board, but the reality is, is different. I have taken you far afield and I apologize um, from, uh, from the particulars of, of the subject matter your committee deals with, but I think it's important to carry that uh, background forward because uh, it helps explain why it's so hard to, um, to address these so, uh, issues that you Commissioner, that we, are immediate. Thank you. Uh, I actually uh, appreciate what you have said because it very much um, resonates, I think, with us when, when you start talking about the ineffectiveness of the current market force situation. And I'm glad that you're bringing that conversation to the FCC and- uh, Oh, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, thank uh, absolutely. you. Absolutely. And, and, and I have to say, I've been but, surprised, but pleased <laughs> that the FCC has been as accessible as it has been. Uh, I'm sure it's not owing to any charm that I have. Uh, <laughs> my, my closing note here, would be before I hand this off to Clay, that um, 
I see what we're what we have to deal with right now is phased. There's the the immediate response to the emergency. There's the uh, 30 to 90 day window of the pandemic. I think um, the legislature is well advised to also be thinking about what happens if scenarios. And the prime what happened if scenario, especially in your field, is what happens if there is a resurgence of the virus uh, come the fall or, or the winter. Uh, I, I have no data on this. This is not my area of expertise and I am happy to uh, refer the matter to Dr. Levine uh, and the administration. They've been doing a wonderful job of uh, making very data-driven um, judgments. But my reading in the area just as a citizen is that we need to be thinking ahead my own parents live in Germany. I've been watching the German response. It's been very different. It's been an emphasis on testing. And even the Germans are thinking about what happens if this uh, virus revives or has a second outburst if we, uh, if we lift these social distancing and, and stay at home measures too soon. So anyway, and then of course, there's the long-term window of what to do if and when funding comes from the federal government that would allow us to more permanently address some of our connectivity issues. And I can assure you that all of those time windows are um, front and center for the department in thinking about, um, about how to advance our teleconnectivity uh, agenda in, in Vermont. The one area that I'm mainly focused on right now is whether there is an ability for Vermont to leverage uh, FEMA resources um, in the teleconnectivity space um, owing to the pandemic. If you accept my analogy that roads and bridges have been torn away, there ought to be um, at least a space to try to make that argument and the department certainly plans to do so. So with that, if the committee members have no questions of me, uh, I would hand the mic over to, uh, to Clay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Senator. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Senator Ingwin, a quick, a quick question for Commission, Commissioner Tierney. Yes, uh, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yes, yes. And um, thank you so much for your comments, especially at the end there, because that was exactly where my, my mind was, was going. Um, you know, Maria presented the numbers of what it would cost to uh, bring the rest of Vermont up to, just up to the bare minimum, the 25-3, um, was three hundred and fifty million dollars, and I and I wondered if you had any, you know, if you were a, a betting a person, if you had, you know, any uh, percentage of uh, uh, hope that maybe FEMA dollars or so, you know, something related to the COVID crisis. Sometimes a crisis can be can present new opportunities, right? So, do you think that this is putting additional pre pressure on the federal government to help, you know, to help us bring the rest of our population, um, you know, up to speed? Um, I. I don't know if it's putting additional pressure on the federal government, but I do think that the federal government has programs that are well established. And I think there is an opportunity to make arguments that are going to fit within the parameters of well established programs. And then, as you can see with the um, paycheck protection <coughs> um, uh, matter, shall we say, if the federal government doesn't put the adequate dollars in there, um, all the programs in the world and all the pressure in the world aren't going to get us there. But I am, um, I, I, I demand of myself to be helpful on that score. Uh, certainly my experience uh, in Tropical Storm Irene, uh, the odds were against uh, any recovery for my property under the hazard mitigation program, but um, people of good faith and good minds ultimately uh, were open enough to arguments uh, to be made so that we could leverage those dollars at the time. So I, I fully intend to do that here and I have to be optimistic in that pursuit. I think for the, the CARES dollars, uh, one of the hitches in that program, I think Maria pointed this out, is that the cost has to be incurred um, directly in response to the pandemic. And it has to be drawn, it, well, here's the question. There is a time frame under CARES now until the end of this year but what we don't understand yet clearly is, does that mean that the, the cost has to be incurred and paid for before December 31st? Does it have to be, do those funds have to be obligated before December 31st? Do they have to be reimbursed? <laughs> we don't know that yet. All I know is that that's eight months. And uh, so if the issue is what, what costs can be sought to be reimbursed from the CARES money in eight months, 
uh, I'm going to be at the table making the argument that whatever the utilities do, if they're able to do something to help us with connectivity solutions and the like, ought to qualify for those funds. And then, of course, FEMA as well. So I hope that right. answers your question. Uh, Godspeed in your, in your quest for Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Clay, off to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, for the record, I'm Clay Purvis with the Department of Public Service. Um, uh, going last um, and, and seeing Maria's presentation, uh, some of what I present will be a repeat. So I'll probably go quickly through um, some of the CARES Act program uh, information and uh, try to fill in um, any anywhere I can uh, questions that you might have on um, on those programs and then uh, talk a little bit about broadband availability in Vermont um, and try to present some information that um, uh, might be pertinent to uh, this committee in particular. So um, I'll start I'm going to try to share my screen um, with you share screen. Uh, I may not share my screen, so um, we have all we have your. Um, I think that okay. We have Great. we have three presentations for you. The the first one is a PowerPoint, and then uh, a data list of uh, institutions or and facilities, medical facilities that have broadband, yeah. and then the map. So you can point us in the right direction. We'll be there. Great. Yeah, there, there are uh, three other maps that I also wanted to share, um, but they're too, um, they're, they were too large to send to the committee uh, through email. So I was hoping to um, bring those up uh, and share them with you on my screen, but I can send you a link. Um, those maps are the broadband availability maps for Vermont. So it's important for you to see those just so you get an idea um, where we have connectivity and where our efforts are going to be focused on uh, bringing um, new connections. So I'll start with the, the uh, PowerPoint presentation, which I have sent as a PDF. Um, so this is the, um, the telehealth programs um, that are uh, available um, at the federal level. Um, the, the first one is the, uh, the COVID-19 telehealth program. Um, I think Maria did a great job of covering this program. So I'll go quickly through it. It's 200 million. The application period opened two days ago. And as Maria pointed out, um, the funds are, are starting to be dispersed. Uh, th there's no deadline set. It's very much first come, first serve. So to the extent that um, Healthcare providers in Vermont can take advantage of, of that program. Uh, it's important to act now. Um, as far as eligibility, um, just about every healthcare facility is eligible, um, but that's defined in the Telecom Act. Um, and Maria's presentation already went through that. Um, the costs have to be incurred during the pandemic. So these are costs related to the pandemic um, beginning March 13th. The cap is 1 million. And um, an important thing to think about is that it's pretty much open nationwide to any healthcare facility, rural and non-rural. So this is a program where we're, we would be competing with um, urban facilities as well, which greatly opens up the number of, um, of healthcare uh, facilities um, that will be um, applying for that money. Um, the supported services under this program, um, this is an important component. Uh, telecommunications and information services such as broadband connectivity for patients um, can be drawn down. Connected devices, tablets, smartphones, and data-enabled devices such as blood pressure monitors, um, there's a whole host of, um, as you probably know, medical devices that are used for monitoring and um, telemedicine. Uh, now, um, an important distinction, though, um, 
this one has to be used for connected devices. So um, equipment that would be used in the home that is not broadband enabled um, is not eligible um, for this program. <clears throat> Um, the second program is the Connected Care Pilot Program. This actually began before the pandemic. Um, it's being fast-tracked in response to the pandemic. So the same FCC order that um, uh, describes and authorizes the use of the 200 million COVID response money also um, uh, activated this program. This is a pilot program. The purpose of this program is <clears throat> for the FCC to, to uh, collect information on um, how they could better spend federal universal service dollars on telehealth. So the, the, um, uh, the focus is really on um, collecting data and piloting different forms of, of connected care. Uh, I believe the committee asked a question about income threshold under this program because there is a focus on um, uh, veterans and low income uh, patients. Um, they didn't cite an income threshold. Uh, it's very much up to the, um, uh, the applicant to describe um, what it is they're trying to do and, and the, um, the, the community of patients they're trying to serve. Um, the FCC, when it makes its decision uh, decisions about uh, who uh, is going to get funding under this program, um, they will announce the rationale for each selection. So um, there, there are no hard and fast rules about um, what qualifies as low income. They're, they're looking to test um, different ideas. There is a focus on public health epidemics. So um, uh, to the extent that uh, applicants can um, show that they're focused on, um, you know, widespread public health um, concerns is important. Um, the, the due date for applications will be soon, but there's no set date yet. It's 45 days after the publication of the Connected Care Pilot Order in the Federal Register. And I don't think it's been printed yet in the Federal Register. So um, that would be coming up very soon. Um, again, eligibility, it's open to the same healthcare providers that the other program is, um, open to rural and non-rural. Um, and like I said, there's a uh, focus on data collection. So there's no applicant limit. Um, it'll all depend on what, um, the number of applications they get and for how much money. Um, as far as supported services go, um, they want to cover 85% of the cost of broadband connectivity for patients, network equipment, and information services. So things like platforms that would be used to deliver uh, telehealth are included. The uh, third program under the FCC is the Rural Healthcare Program. Um, this has been a longstanding program. Um, this helps healthcare facilities access broadband and telecommunication services. So it's broken into two sub programs the Healthcare Connect and the Telecom Program. Uh, it, it's about $571 million a year paid for through the Universal Service Fund. Um, uh, rural health care providers are eligible, so this is not a program where we're competing with uh, urban counterparts, um, though non-rural facilities are eligible if they are a member of a consortium that is mostly rural, so they're serving over 50% rural market. Um, many Vermont facilities already participate in this, including the major hospitals in Vermont. Um, so this is a program that Vermont is doing a good job of drawing down already. Um, as far as supported services, um, it subsidizes the cost of um, telephone service. So it brings the, the cost of rural telephone into parity with urban rates. 
Um, so it makes um, telephone service cheaper. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Healthcare Connect program provides a 65% discount on dark fiber uh, business data needs and DSL and private carriage line, as well as um, uh, I omitted from this um, other broadband. So um, the bias service that um, hospitals would buy. Um, so this is um, this is an important program that um, we already use. Please stop me if you have any questions. Um, the last no, major no, we're not going to stop you because we're, we're you know we've got we've got like six minutes uh, before we have to be at another meeting. So okay, thank you for letting me know that. I will yeah, I will go I, quickly. Okay. I, wish, I wish we had more time. I really do. So, okay, well, great. then it would probably be helpful for me to, um, to move on. Um, this is the USDA uh, telehealth and distance yeah. learning program. Yeah. Um, this is really for hardware. Um, so uh, grant, um, grantees that get uh, money through this uh, program are mostly spending it on equipment. Um, it does support some broadband transmission facilities. Up to 20% of the grant can be used for broadband transmission to the facility, but that's really for the drop or for um, a fiber connection between two buildings or something like that. It's not, um, not gonna be used for widespread broadband deployment. Um, it's really inside wiring and that kind of thing. Um, this is um, our broadband statistics uh, broken down. Um, I wish I had more time to explain them. Uh, I think it's important for you to understand what the buckets are. We're putting um, broadband um, in, into buckets. Um, you see on the left-hand side, uh, four one megabits per second. That is DSL. So we map broadband at four one megabits per second up to 25.3. So anything that's less than 25.3, but more than four one, we're covering 93% of the state with that broadband, uh, that level of broadband service. 25.3 or better is uh, more or less cable. So um, companies like Comcast, Charter, um, Duncan Cable, we have, I think, 10 cable companies, Stowe uh, Cable. Um, that This is the service they provide. Um, I just want to be clear that um, almost no one sells 25.3 service. The cable companies are selling something much higher, um, 50 megs, 100 megs, 150 megs. Um, they can even do a gig down to a lot of their service territory now. Um, what they can't do is the upload speed of 100, 100. So 100, 100 bucket is really fiber. Um, that's fiber to the home. Um, and that's companies like EC Fiber, Burlington Telecom. Vermont Telephone has fiber to every location in its traditional telephone network. Um, so I'm going to move along to a map that I provided to you this morning called Broadband Deployment at Health. Uh, at Vermont Health Centers. Um, so you see in the legend, the same buckets, fiber, cable, and DSL. We've got one, um, one location that appears to not have good broadband, uh, but by and large, we have um, most healthcare facilities are, are well served with um, service that's either fiber or um, uh, good cable service. Um, so, uh, to us, the, the issue would not be uh, broadband to healthcare facilities, but rather broadband to patients. Um, Can I ask a question about that? Uh, yeah. Because I, mean, I, I think um, the whole issue of communications uh, does get to the patient. And so what we've heard from some of our hospitals and our hospital clinics is that in, at least during this pandemic, there are a number of vulnerable uh, folks, uh, older or some other autoimmune or whatever their 
condition is, who are somewhat isolated and particularly isolated from internet access. Um, and it, as I know that public safety, I know um, um, the direct, director of 911, oh gosh, uh, anyway, senior moment, um, has been, uh, does reach out and look for people who are in that situation. Uh, and I know you've been, a, you've been great at going around and looking for uh, cell phone access through the state. Is there any initiative going on right now to with the healthcare community or communicating to the healthcare community about reporting, uh, identifying those people who don't have access and to link them with some kind of an application particular in the particularly with the first grant that you were talking about the 200 million dollars that's now going out is it is that happening because it seems to me that there there's got to be a collection of people out there right now who are really hurting yeah, don't want I, them going out I, I think that that's important data to get and uh, we uh, begin uh engaging with the uh, uh, telehealth consortium in the state. Um, and I think that's in line with what June discussed about our effort to, to find um, uh, residents who are having connectivity issues. So um, that's something that uh, we'd like to work on. Um, I don't think we have um, a, de a developed um, system yet, but it's something that we've started thinking about and, and hope to um, be able to facilitate soon because uh, it's an important question uh, yeah. that, um, that well, needs you to know, be addressed quickly. Right, I, th I think Commissioner Tierney wants to make a comment too, but the uh, certainly uh, Director Neal's program, CARE program with 911 deploying radio access, but it might be interesting to connect those people. Commissioner Tierney, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to underscore what Clay's saying. Um, we, the, the appeal that we made this morning specifically asks for people with, um, you know, connectivity issues who have medical needs to identify themselves. I think it probably um, goes without saying that people who are related to such a person or have an acquaintance, neighbors and the like, they may see the appeal as well and make the connection, but that's not the the only step I think that we would be taking. Right. This is a first cut. Uh, talking to uh, Barb Neal is also a, a good idea. I regret to to say that um, that we also find there are privacy issues. Oh yes, that we have to deal with, which is is why we went in the first instance with the direct appeal. It's like if you're willing to disclose yourself, right. then we at least know who you are, and that's a start. Uh, I'm guess, mindful of your time. <laughs> so. Oh, uh, you know, I wish we had another hour. Um, this is a great start. Uh, Clay, I, um, <clears throat> I know you probably have 12 other maps to show us and we'd like to see them. I, I can I can send the link so you can take a look. We have uh, a lot of information on our website um, about broadband availability broken down by town. So um, I'll send that information to you. And if you're interested in seeing, you know, which which towns are hurting the most uh, with broadband availability. Um, we'll have that for you. Thank you. Um, this has been very enlightening. Uh, the work that you're doing is terrific. I want to thank uh, Maria again for your in-depth uh, presentation of the programs that are out there. And you, you're probably getting really good at this, <laughs> but we do appreciate it. We will come back with more questions. Commissioner Tierney, thank you very much for your perspective and your input. Um, I, I hope that we can continue to work together. I know that we'll be looking at possible communications uh, with our federal delegation and perhaps with our commissioner of Department of Public Service. So that would be good to stay linked up with you and Clay. And just, to, you. just to make the point, uh, Chair Lyons, uh, we're also in contact with the Fed delegation. Just so you're aware of that. Okay. I figured. We don't want to. We don't want to take a step that steps on a toe. We want to make sure that we're working together on this. So, all right, committee, we're late for our next meeting, and I want to thank you all for um, your endurance um, and your interest. But uh, we'll come back to this for discussion purposes, uh, if not early next week, sometime uh, the week after. So, thank you. Take care.
see you Thank in you. a minute. We're finished. Nellie, we're Julie, we're finished. All right, ending live stream.